Hey everybody, this is Michael, um, and for our project for microbiology, I chose to talk about the Coxsackie B virus and its relationship, or not, to the onset of type 1 diabetes. Um, before we get carried away, we'll talk a little bit more about what Coxsackie B really is. There's a family of these, Coxsackie B 1 through 6 is one they talk about the most. Um, it is a group 4 virus, which of course, if you remember, means it is positive sense single strand RNA, which means it can readily replicate um, without having to be translated like it would if it were a negative sense. Um, it has an icosahedral capsid. If you remember that, of course, it means it has 20 equal sides to the, the protein capsid on the outside. Primary transmission of Coxsackie B is by the fecal oral route, respiratory, and transplacental, and we'll talk more about that in just a little bit, about transmission of this virus from mom to baby, and how that increases the likelihood, at least theoretically, of type 1 diabetes. Coxsackie B viruses are implicated in things like myocarditis, um, hepatitis, um, and just feelings of general malaise, and there is mounting evidence um, over the years of a relationship between Coxsackie B infection and the onset of type 1 diabetes or what's called insulin dependent diabetes. So since we've brought up insulin we need to really talk about what insulin does. Insulin of course is a hormone made by your body specifically in the pancreas and insulin's job is to mediate glucose transport into our cells. If you remember correctly there are plenty of molecules and plenty of things which can move freely across our cell membranes. Things like oxygen, carbon dioxide, other small nonpolar molecules, things like that. Some things have to be endocytosed into our um, cells to be metabolized or to, for our cells to use them. Glucose has to be actively transported using transport proteins. Now, so when we think about insulin, we often think that insulin moves sugar into our cells. It doesn't really do that at all. What it does is it stimulates our transport proteins to do the job for us. So you see our sad little cell there, and our sad little cell, he's sad because he's hungry. Um, and right outside his door there is our glucose, our six carbon sugar molecule, trying to get in, but it can't because those transport proteins represented by the little um, pentagons there are stuck in the middle of the cell. In order for them to move things across the membrane, they have to be moved out to the cell membrane where they can work. And that's where insulin comes in. So when insulin shows up in our blood, and yeah, insulin kind of looks like a, a clown wig, it stimulates our transport proteins in our cells to move from the center of the cell out to the cell membrane, where they can grab hold of that sugar, move it into the cell. Now our cell is happy because he's fed and everything goes on like it's supposed to. Well, when this doesn't happen, when the insulin doesn't show up, that's when we have somebody who has type 1 diabetes. And how this happens, um, type 1 diabetes is a genetic disease. You typically get that from your mom or your dad or both. We'll talk about that epidemiology in a minute. Um, it's autoimmune. So what happens is our B cell macrophages turn on and destroy our insulogenic beta cells um, through a process we'll talk about in a second in relation to the virus. Um, when you lose 75 or 80 percent of your beta cells and this is a beta cell here at the bottom, and these little black and gray dots, those are our insulogenic pores in the beta cell. That's where insulin comes from. And this is where the B cells will get into, and they'll attack that and eventually kill those things. Um, and if you lose 75% of your beta cell mass, then you go into what's called insulogenic failure, which leads to type 1 diabetes. You don't make insulin anymore. Um, and as far as the viral component to that, that was reported as early as 1971. Um, then they thought it was rubella and there's still some evidence to say that maybe that's true but now Coxsackie B seems to be the the primary viral trigger if that indeed exists. Um, so we go back to our illustration here we see our sad little hungry cell and now insulin never shows up and so when insulin never shows up the sugar just keeps coming because we keep eating we keep eating and so now the sugar accumulates in our blood, but our cells begin to starve because 
the sugar can't get in there. So a lot of really nasty things begin to happen. One of the first and most noticeable things is we have this enormous osmotic shift because all that sugar out there is hypertonic. And so it's going to pull water out of the cells and out of the interstitial fluid and begin to dehydrate us. The way we typically see um, the kids that go into that develop type 1 diabetes and go into DKA, which we'll talk about in a minute, the way we see them present is they get fatigued and they start drinking like crazy and peeing like crazy because all their fluids moving into their bloodstream and their kidneys are getting rid of it. And so that's the first thing that happens. Then as your cells start to starve, they start to send signals to your brain and your brain sends signals to your liver and to other places to start making sugar in really inefficient ways that your cells still can't use. And so we start making more sugar, making the problem worse and worse and worse. And DKA is, is really, really nasty and it's really really dangerous and we'll talk more about how that works and who gets that in just a minute but this is basically how our our diabetes is going to develop um epidemiology of type 1 diabetes our peak presentation is about five to seven years old a little less than two out of every thousand kids under 19 has it about 13,000 new cases every year um, here's a genetic component if mom is a type 1 diabetic, you got about a 3% chance. If dad is alone, you got about a 6% chance. If they both are, your chances go way, way up, almost 30%, that they are going to make a kid who will develop type 1 diabetes. No real gender bias when it comes to diabetes. Male and female are about equal. And three to five times more Caucasian people than African American people will develop type 1 diabetes. The typical first presentation of type 1 diabetes is DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis. Incredibly dangerous and incredibly nasty disease. Up to 30% of new cases, again, in that about 5 to 10 year old age range, will present in DKA. That'll be the first time anybody ever knows they're diabetic. Um, if they're under 4, that number goes up even more. Uh, about 4 to 8 out of every 1,000 diabetics a year are going to develop DKA. Uh, a little over 100,000 hospital admissions every year, and it's the most common cause of death in diabetics less than 20 years old with a mortality reaching about 5%. This disease also tends to hide in the summertime because kids are active and they go running outside and they're drinking a lot and they're peeing a lot, and nobody thinks anything about it until they start vomiting and they start getting really, really fatigued and they don't want to eat anymore and they don't want to run around anymore, but they keep drinking and they keep peeing. And by then, a lot of things are at work and those kids are already getting really, really sick. And that's typically how the parents find out their kids are, are going to be a diabetic. So what's the virus got to do with this? Um, Coxsackie B was isolated as a possible trigger for new onset diabetes back in 1983. Um, specifically, the strains Coxsackie B1, 3, and 4, um, 2, 5, and 6 are typically associated with other things like the myocarditis and things like that. Um, and the thinking here is, is that a Coxsackie B infection of those beta cells is what triggers the T cells to turn on the B cell macrophages to get in there and start destroying that. And they destroy those insulogenic cells trying to kill the virus. And so, and that's what leads us down that road. Um, our evidence for this, uh, one study found, and all these studies that I'm, I reference here are in the um, review package, which is there. I got a link for at the end of the presentation. Um, about 30% of new onset adult type 1 diabetics had Coxsackie B RNA in their blood at the time of onset versus 0% of the controls. Um, another study looked specifically at kids and they found that 64% of new onset diabetics less than 6 years old had the Coxsackie B RNA in their blood versus only 4% of the controls. And in a post-mortem evaluation of people who died from diabetic complications, they found that about half of those had the Coxsackie B virus in their pancreatic cells and that those pancreatic cells were damaged versus 0% of the controls there. One caveat to all this, these were super, super small studies. Um, so it's really hard to extract. I mean, between all three of these studies, they enrolled about 50 diabetics. And so incredibly small, not definitive by any means, but it's certainly thought provoking. So when you start talking about a viral cause of anything that leads you to ask, well, what are other possible causes for that? Um, this is a great article. I put the, the title and everything here so you could find it and look it up if you wanted to read about this. Um, these authors make really good cases for and against the viral trigger for diabetes. And some of their alternate hypotheses 
are that the viral infection may very well be protective depending on when you get it and which strain of Coxsackie B you get because it may help you turn on the immune response which would help you fight off a particularly pathogenic strain which may elicit the type 1 diabetes cascade. Um, another hypothesis is that the viral infection doesn't matter. It's inconsequential. Um, and then, if you remember from our reading, we talked about the hygiene hypothesis, where over the years, because we live cleaner, we have clean water, we have clean food, we have all these antibiotics, that we've lost a lot of our gut microbiome. Um, they also, in a particularly interesting part, possibly attribute the rise of type 1 diabetes in affluent countries to the hygiene hypothesis that we're just too clean because believe it or not type 1 diabetes is far more prevalent in industrialized clean countries like the United States than it is in third world countries we just don't see it that much and they hypothesize that because we're so clean that's probably why another question you have to ask when you talk about the virus being responsible for something can we vaccinate against it um, and this work is ongoing as we speak this article that's listed there just came out this year um, where they are working diligently toward a Coxsackie B based vaccine in the hopes of being able to vaccinate kids when they're very young, perhaps all the rest of the vaccines, to especially those kids which have a genetic predisposition. Um, it's similar to the polio vaccine because Coxsackie B is an enterovirus, so it's of the same family as polio. So the vaccination process and developing that vaccine is following kind of the same line. Um, currently being tested in mice, it's already been approved um, in other places around the world. We just don't have it here. And most of the work today is focused on effectiveness of the vaccine, safety of course, and scaling that up to produce it. Um, so what's the future of Coxsackie B or in general environmental causes or triggers for type 1 diabetes? Um, one really intriguing thing was a Teddy study. Uh, you can go to the link there and see what they're doing. They're enrolling kids basically at birth and then following them through 15 or 20 years, who both kids who have genetic predispositions and don't, to see when they onset with diabetes, what's going on with them. They draw their blood. They're doing. They're really, really following these kids a lot. It's a huge, huge study. The biggest one to look at this kind of thing. So this, once it's done, this should help answer a lot of questions. Um, living with diabetes is never going to be cool but the days of three and four daily finger sticks and injections of insulin are rapidly coming to an end just through technology. Um, there are smartphone apps and uh, component devices which help kids, adults, everybody measure their blood sugar in real time. It helps them manage their insulin. Insulin pumps are, I've gotten much more advanced. So it's not great to be a diabetic but it's not as bad as it used to be. And this is yet another one of those things when you talk about the diseases which are transmitted fecal oral where washing your hands may make a difference. Are we going to stop diabetes by washing our hands every single time? Probably not, but it's possible we can make a difference by not transmitting this virus to people who are at risk just by practicing good hygiene. Um, the link at the bottom of the page, I'll go ahead and flip over because it's on the next one too. Um, that, at that link you can download the four articles that I did for this as long as, as well as my summations. Um, you can reach me at that email address or that's my website uh, if you have any questions and I look forward to hearing from you. Thanks a whole lot.